Today, March Madness is one of the largest sporting events in the nation. 68 of the best college teams compete to prove who has the most athletic and skilled program. 50 years ago, this was a different case. Back then, the NCAA tournament was about a quarter of the size it is today and not nearly as popular. It was also almost exclusively played by white students, led by white coaches, and watched by white fans. On March 19, 1966, the NCAA College Basketball Championship was played. Texas Western coach Don Haskins made history by deciding to start his five best players, all of whom were black. His leadership in their championship victory over an all-white Kentucky squad showed that black players could be just as disciplined as white players. The win also proved to be an indispensable moment in the integration of college basketball, especially in the South. College basketball before the late 1960s was predominantly a white man's sport. The majority of players and coaches had the same color skin, white. This was especially true in the American South. During the Jim Crow era, segregated colleges and universities forced the majority of African American students into second-rate schools and out of mainstream athletics. After World War II, attitudes towards African Americans changed due to the cooperation between blacks and whites in the military. Gradually, throughout the rest of the 40s and 50s, much of the nation abandoned obvious racial discrimination, but the South resisted change. This can be seen in the Brown vs. Board of Education ruling in 1954. In this case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled separate but equal unconstitutional. This included the segregation of schools. Regardless of this, many Southern universities delayed admitting colored students until the 60s, and even then often kept them out of sports. In 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson had set up the idea that separate and equal was okay. That, that was constitutional, right? And so it's now almost 60 years later that Brown versus Board of Education overturns that and says no, separate is un inherently unequal. And so that sets in motion a chain of events which includes the Civil Rights Movement. Basketball remained a white sport in the South. Liberals in this time believed that the integration of college basketball would do two things. Directly, it could provide opportunity for individual African Americans. Indirectly, it could provide a model for future integration in other areas of American life. White players in the South were often frightened by the possible shame of losing to an integrated team. Consequentially, white teams avoided scheduling games against teams, generally from the North, with black players on them. Even when an all-white team played an integrated team, there was an unspoken gentleman's agreement that the integrated team would leave their colored players on the bench. Although even this didn't happen very often, because several states and cities even passed laws that prohibited interracial sporting events, such as in Birmingham, Alabama, and New Orleans, Louisiana. College basketball just needed a leader to step up and alter the idea that it was a white man's sport. That man would be Don Haskins. Donald Lee Haskins was born on March 16, 1930 in Enid, Oklahoma. As a teen, Haskins would go down to Enid Park with his friend Herman Carr and play basketball. Carr was an African American and therefore was not allowed to attend the same high school as Haskins. Haskins would graduate from Enid High School in 1948. That same year, he would be named an All-State pitcher on the baseball team and also an All-State guard on the basketball team. He would be called the best player in all of Oklahoma, but he knew inside that he wasn't even the best player in Enid. Herman Carr was the best. Haskins even credited Carr with teaching him how to shoot, but because Carr was an African American, he had to play at Washington High where he didn't get any press or any scholarship offers, compared to the hundreds of scholarship offers Haskins received. This is when Haskins would initially realize the racism in Southern athletics. He would feel sympathy for his friend as he realized that this system was extremely unfair and that it was seemingly as if Carr didn't exist. Haskins would go on to play his college ball under coach Henry Iba at Oklahoma A&M. When asked about his time playing under coach Iba, Haskins would respond, it was four years of hell. Iba was the meanest son of a gun you'll ever meet. Haskins admired the success Iba's style of play brought him and would model himself after Coach Iba by being strict and disciplined when he started his own coaching career in small towns at the high school level in Texas. In 1961, Haskins would take his leadership to the college level, head coaching at Texas Western University. Haskins would immediately have success at Texas Western with his team earning 18 wins while only suffering 6 losses and narrowly missing the title of conference champions. He would also have success in 1963 and 1964 leading both teams to the NCAA tournament. 
In 1965, Haskins would post a subpar record of 16-9, as his team would only get an invitation to the NIT tournament. Haskins would prove throughout his first four years at the college level that he had the leadership abilities to be an elite coach. However, it would be the 1966 season that would revolutionize not only college basketball, but Southern culture as well. It left a lasting mark on me. Here was a person who bled the same color as I did, yet he was treated differently. That's why it was very, very easy for me to treat all of my players the exact same, regardless of what they looked like. The 1956-66 season was also the most radical season. Haskins consistently started five black players, Bobby Joe Hill, David Latin, Orston Artis, Willie Worsley, and Harry Flournoy. His main substitutes were two more black players, Willie Cager and Neville Shedd, plus a Mexican-American and only one white player. The other three white players on the team only saw limited playing time. At that time, only three major colleges in the South had any black players on the team at all, and no major white college in the entire country started as many black players as Haskins did that season. When the school president warned Haskins about starting this many black players, he responded by saying that he was only starting his five best players that coincidentally happened to be black. Haskins continued to start the players exactly as he had beforehand, and the team finished with its best record ever, going 23-1 and and achieving a number three ranking going into the NCAA tournament. In the tournament, Haskins continued starting his best players without regard for color and Texas Western continued to win. They easily defeated Oklahoma City 89-74, narrowly beat Cincinnati 78-76 in overtime, and barely survived Kansas 81-80 in double overtime. In the national semifinals, they brushed past Utah 85-78 to reach the national championship game against Kentucky. Kentucky head coach Adolph Rupp had put together an all-white team who was heavily favored to win against the supposedly less disciplined interracial team. However, that was not to be the case. After some back and forth points had the game tied in the first half, the Miners pulled away and never lost their lead. Texas Western would win the game 72-65, upsetting the heavily favored Wildcats and shocking the world. The game had many immediate consequences on Southern basketball. The first was that the following season, every conference had at least one integrated basketball team. According to historian Charles Martin, It was quite clear after March 1966 that Southern basketball teams would have to change or become increasingly non-competitive nationally. Within the next five years, Auburn and Florida would both have four black players on their teams. Vanderbilt would have three, Mississippi and Tennessee would both have two, and even LSU would have one. The change was obvious. That change is still present today. For example, African Americans now account for 57.2% of Division I men's basketball players. Now, it would be an unusual sight to watch a college basketball game and see exclusively white players, coaches, and fans. Now, Kentucky's roster includes 12 African American players. In 1998, Kentucky won the national championship under its first African-American head coach, Tubby Smith. In respect to his 98 team winning with a predominantly black lineup and a black head coach, Smith would comment, That 1966 championship game was the first step toward this. Haskins' legacy extended to more than just college basketball. It was seen in other sports, both collegiate and professional, and in many other aspects of American life. All of us who were young saw that 66 game and felt like there was hope for us. The man gave black people a chance. In conclusion, Don Haskins' exceptional leadership during the 1966 NCAA championship game inspired many other coaches to recruit players from different races. This caused schools from around the country to integrate more rapidly following the game. Haskins had created a model for the future of college basketball, especially in the American South, that was focused around the idea of integration. This model proved that integration was a possibility and encouraged communities to follow the example put forth by the Texas Western Miners.